The reading is from the sixth chapter of Mark's Gospel, where it says, King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah, and others said, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she couldn't. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask of me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Well, a Bible reading like that can sure put a damper on Christmas, huh? You came to an Advent service as part of your Christmas preparation. And you hear a story about a prophet imprisoned, about John beheaded, the messenger of Messiah shut up behind prison walls and cut down by an executioner's sword. You came to hear about a child who's about to get his start in life, and instead you hear about a prophet, a preacher, a baptizer who is about at the end of his life. We want to hear about a child who's going to deliver us and be delivered in Bethlehem at a stable, but we get to hear about the forerunner who was incarcerated in Herod's prison. In what world does this make sense? <laughs> that this is part of the Advent story, part of our Christmas preparation. But I suppose that's Christmas for you. Someone brings stability into a world where the only thing that you can count on is that you can't count on anything to last. This world is filled with changes and chances, constant flexes and variants, revolutions, reformations, political pendulums swinging, and power grabs to boot. The only thing that never changes is the fact that everything keeps on changing. Just look at the end of John the Baptist's life. He's caught up in this never-ending power-hungry, sin-defending, prophet-imprisoning, killing-the-messenger cycle. Jesus said in the Beatitudes, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. 
The cycle just keeps on returning in the scriptures. Prophet after prophet bringing God's holy word. But instead of people listening and adjusting, instead of people repenting, they shut up God's word. They refuse to listen. They refuse to change. And I suppose that's the only thing that never changes, huh? And how does any of this fit into Advent or Christmas? Well, I've been telling you for a couple of weeks now that John the Baptist is the main figure of the Advent season. He is the one that the Bible shines a spotlight on as we get ready to welcome the Christ. He prepares the way for the Messiah. His nativity comes first, then Jesus' nativity, John's ministry, then Jesus' ministry, and even now, we get John's persecution first before the persecution of Jesus. We must have Advent before Christmas. And I know that our American culture and Western culture has pretty much reduced Advent into just the pre-Christmas Christmas. We've forgotten how to prepare. I know we still put up our trees and wrap our presents, but we skip right over Advent and get right into Christmas as soon as we possibly can. And you know what? I don't blame us. I don't blame us a bit. Advent brings up some issues, and we don't always like to look at those. But Advent has to come before Christmas. We must have a reason for the Christ. Law, then gospel. We preach sin, then grace. There's a cross before the glory. We must notice that this world is lying in anticipation, expectation for someone great to come along and set things right. Otherwise, we are trapped in these never-ending cycles. And we need John the Baptist to tell us. Otherwise, we'd miss him when he arrives. We'd miss Jesus. We need John to prepare the way. Otherwise, we wouldn't see. We'd look for the Savior, the King, the Messiah, but the most people at the first Christmas, like them, we would overlook the baby born for us. So Christmas is the celebration that someone was showing up to give us something we can count on, something consistent. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He came to stabilize the world, but he was delivered in the temporary housing of a stable. He came to enrich the world, but he was born to peasants. He came to serve the world, but his own did not receive him. The world was looking for a leader. But only a baby came. The world almost missed Jesus entirely. The only ones who saw him were shepherds, but just because they were beckoned by the angels, and magi because they saw the star. The great king came in infant form. The maker came in human flesh, the son of God to poor parents. And hardly anyone saw him for what he was. Or noticed him when he arrived. Would you have noticed? Would you have seen him and thought, there's my king? That's my prince of peace? Even John the Baptist, as Jesus had grown and his ministry had begun, and John had pointed Jesus out to his own disciples who went following Jesus instead of John, John the Baptist became the one who decreased so that Jesus could increase. But even the forerunner nearly looked past Jesus. In the middle of John's persecution, incarceration, for speaking truth to power, he sent his disciples to ask Jesus this question in Matthew chapter 11. When John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by the disciples, by his disciples, and said to Jesus, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? True, John had heard about Jesus' mighty deeds, miracles, wonders, signs, but John was hearing it all secondhand, and he was looking at it all from inside a prison cell, and that's not a very good perspective. John wanted to know if Jesus really was the one, the one who would turn it all around, because right now it all turns south. 
and serving for Jesus was not paying off. You have times like that too. Where you think, I'm hitching my wagon to Jesus. I'm following him. I'm going to throw in with this Savior. And you have expectations and anticipations of what will happen with your life. And we think, it's going to get better. My family is going to relate better to each other. I'll have the power of Jesus in me. No doubt I'll live a healthier life. I'll have the Spirit of the Lord on me. I'm sure I'm going to sin less. Finally conquer those foes. Overcome those demons. Overcome this flesh. And so, when that doesn't happen, when life gets harder, not easier, when we get ill instead of well, when our family experiences more discord than concord, we wonder, are you, are you the one? Should I look for another? Tim Keller recently wrote, while other worldviews lead us to sit in the midst of life's joys, foreseeing the coming sorrows, Christianity empowers its people to sit in the midst of this world's sorrows, tasting the coming joy. I'd add that any joys we experience even right now, and we do, they pale in comparison with the joy that we'll experience someday. John was not sitting in life's joys. He was in the middle of suffering. And while John anticipated Jesus would change everything the minute that he showed his face in the ministry at the Jordan River, the part of the plan that John was missing was that Jesus coming into the world was going to have two major moves, not one. John assumed one major move. I baptize people, I preach repentance, Jesus comes, and everything changes. But Jesus planned two moves. There is the end of the world coming, as John anticipated, but before that is this first coming. Hidden, in obscurity, where hardly anyone would notice, Jesus came first to prepare us for his final coming. So there will be the great finish, a worldwide, global, glorious arrival for which John was preparing his audience. John is the great prophet in the spirit and power of Elijah, sent by God, as Malachi 4, 5 said, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. But while John's view of Christ's coming was accurate, it was also insufficient. John did not understand that Jesus would first move into the world, humbly, not gloriously, quietly, not noticeably, discreetly, not obviously. So, John's ministry is marked by suffering, and he called people to suffer with him. Before Christ comes to judge the world, Christ came first to be judged for the world. Before Christ comes to reveal heaven, he first opens the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Before Christ comes to reveal the glory he puts in us, he first leads us through grief, through shame, through pain, through crosses that we bear. Ray Ortland wrote this article from Desiring God's website, and he says, Jesus isn't recruiting heavy hitters he wants wounded people, exhausted people, people with doubts, people with weaknesses, injured by their own sins and by the sins of others. Those are the people he brings into his kingdom and serves. Well, John fits nicely there, doesn't he? He had his doubts, his questions, his misplaced expectations, and we have ours too. We sometimes question Jesus like John did. Are you the one who was to come? <laughs> or do we look for someone else? This can't be it, can it? 
surely there's something more, something I'm missing. Do I really want to trust you completely, wholeheartedly? I mean, yes, maybe for forgiveness of sins and for an entrance into heaven, but for my life on earth, do I really want to trust your word? When I had an anticipation and an expectation that you're going to set some things right in my life and they're still wrong, do I really want to follow you? If everything isn't adding up just yet for you, there's good reason. We're not at the end just yet. But listen to the answer that Jesus gave John's disciples to take back to him. Jesus said, go tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised. And the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. We don't have all the answers yet. Sometimes we have as much doubt as we have faith. As many questions as we have answers. There's plenty that's still not right. But that baby born in a stable is the Prince of Peace. That Messiah John couldn't quite make heads or tails of is the promised one. We don't have all the answers. Not yet. Not enough to satisfy all the questions, but we have an answer to a really important question. Why did Jesus rise from the dead? Why did Jesus rise? If he's not the one, then that shouldn't have happened. But if he's risen from the dead, then he is the one. And what he gives us is a glimpse of how things will be. Something to look ahead to in the middle of our suffering until his glorious day arrives. We have the Savior who satisfied God for us and will satisfy us thoroughly, completely, entirely in the future at his final coming because he came first in time to get us ready for that last day. Amen.